Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see all of you here in the museum and uh, also all of you online. My name is Daryl Youngman and uh, become acquainted with the museum through our business, Just So Vintage, that my wife and I do. Uh, for some years, we've been interested in uh, the renewed interest in sewing and quilting and the vintage machines that, that go with that renewed interest. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, next slide. Before we get into the twilight of sewing that's been some decades ago and the Renaissance that's been more recently, I think it's real interesting and helpful to go back to the beginning of the sewing machine as an invention and not only look at the technological history and the development of the sewing machine, but the many ways that sewing machines have impacted our history and our culture. Sewing machines are a fantastic technological development, and we'll talk about some of those details as we go on. But sewing machines have also contributed to historical impacts and some cultural and social impacts. Sewing machines are not just an invention. Uh, Maybe the wheel was an invention, maybe the axe was an invention, but the sewing machine is really a product of many, many, many inventions. Uh, that's part of the blessing of the development of the sewing machine and in a way part of the curse of the path of development that sewing machines have taken. It required the invention of a needle. In the past, we think of uh, needles with the thread high in the back and the point in the front. That wasn't working when people tried to develop sewing machines that would work. So it was a major invention to come up with the eye of the needle to be in the point instead of the back. There had to be a means of feeding the fabric through the mechanism so that the needle and the thread could encounter each other correctly and produce a good stitch in the fabric. Bobbins. In the past, before sewing machines, you had a spool of thread, presumably a needle, and you took care of how that, uh, that thread arrived to become part of the stitch. But there needed to be the bobbins, and tension mechanisms had to be developed. So all of these inventions are uh, being worked on by various people at the time. And in 1844, John Fisher was the first person to put these inventions together, aggregate them into one machine that actually would sew stitches in the fabric. But it wasn't meant to succeed. Uh, Fisher was the first in the field, but there were a lot of other people close behind him, and Fisher's invention ran into some serious complications with patent rights, licensing agreements, and a lot of other legal issues. So when, like I said, in the beginning, several inventors eventually con contributed to the development. Fisher, yes. Hall was responsible for bringing the eye of the needle to the point, among other things. Uh, Singer, manufacturing and marketing genius, uh, if you will. Wheeler, Wilson, and other others that we may have heard of along the line. So all of these individuals and more brought their expertise, their ideas, uh, their entrepreneurship, if you will, to the table. And by 1850, we had the first practical sewing machines. Uh, Singer, Howe, and many others, whose names would probably be familiar to you in the sewing machine business even today, participated in the sewing machine combine. The sewing machine combine was, uh, in my opinion, kind of a nifty solution to the cacophony of patents, uh, patent disputes, uh, legal licensing issues that were going on. Uh, even if you took the very major players in the industry at that time, probably you'd have at least a dozen major parties. Uh, what the sewing machine combine did was sit around the table, probably literally at that time, because they didn't have virtual meetings, and iron out their differences and say, okay, you know, you've got the patent on the needle, you've got the patent on the feed, I've got the patent on the bobbin, but there's enough demand out there where we can all make money building our own sewing machines and selling to anxious customers. So they settled, uh, many uh, legal disputes around the table and they agreed on a joint aggregate licensing fee, privilege fee, whatever, that would allow all these manufacturers to take advantage of all the different patents and then go about with a marketing and a service structure that would bring these machines to the customer and maintain them after the point of sale. 
that was in the 1860s, early 1860s, and it worked well until some of these patents uh, it started expiring approximately 1980. And, and after that, the field was leveled out. By 1900, over 20 million sewing machines a year were being produced in numerous factories. Uh, and I don't know what the population of the world was at that time, but 20 million is a lot of units of anything. So this is an industry in 50 years that rose from infancy, went through some, uh, some growth pains, and came out very successfully by the dawn of the 20th century. Next slide. This is a slide here. Uh, I'm not going to read the fine print to you, but this is a nice summary of uh, some of the goings on in the earliest years of the development of the sewing machine between the first early dimensions and the sewing machine combination. Uh, this is going to be available to those of you who are here in the audience today in person, and I think we can make it available to our remote virtual users too. So I'm going to move on past this slide. I mentioned that uh, sewing machines were a great technological development. There's a lot of machining processes, a lot of assembly, uh, metal casting, a lot of just industrial processes that existed at the time sewing machines were developed, but were able to develop and advance remarkably because of the massive demand in uh, production for sewing machines. <clears throat> in many aspects, and I'm just going to name a couple here for our, our talk this afternoon, in many aspects the technology of sewing actually got ahead of society a little bit. Uh, in 1882 there was an international electri electric exposition in London. Uh, today we might think of it as kind of a World's Fair type event. Well, at that event there was an electric sewing machine develop, uh, developed and demonstrated an electric sewing machine. Sit down, plug in the motor and go. Except in 1882 vast, vast percentages of the population didn't have electricity. So, the sewing machine industry got its ducks in a row with the sewing machine combine and other initiatives. They went into mass production, but the world really wasn't ready for electric sewing machines yet. Another example of sewing technology leading society is the zigzag. Uh, Singer had developed the zigzag pretty well by the 1890s. Uh, unfortunately, not really many people in the customer base could understand why you might want to have a zigzag machine. And some of you that are more familiar with uh, machines that maybe have come down to you in your family realize that over the years, the earlier earlier decades of the 20th century, there were attachments that would allow sewing machines to zigzag. In other words, you could have a straight stitch sewing machine, put the zigzag attachment on and make zigzag. But even though they were successful and they worked reasonably well, they really never caught on with the public on a massive scale until the 1940s. So another example where the sewing technology was there, but technology, or society, excuse me, had not really evolved to take advantage of that developing technology. I mentioned that sewing technology has also influenced our culture. Yeah, this is kind of fascinating. Uh, Gay and I used to talk about the history of the machine. This is when zigzag was invented. This was when round bobbins came into use. But I think a lot of the p appeal for us, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you here today will realize, it's the cultural connections, the community connections, a lot of family connections. And in so many cases, the sewing machine is a component in those connections. We are very close to the Oregon Trail here, and a lot of people on the way west brought sewing machines with them, and we'll talk about an example here a little bit later. But in the development of the west, settlers moving out to areas that were extremely remote, miles away from pretty much any kind of a settlement, could be more self-sufficient and self-reliant if they had a sewing machine. It was an important tool. Conversely, as people moved off the farm, in the late 1800s and moved into urban areas, they were not in a position to supply their own food, their own clothing, because they had to be at the factory every day. Uh, Ready-made clothing became more important as in those years, and that, and among other factors, 
created occupations outside the home for women on a scale that really hadn't been seen before. There were always a few seamstresses around, uh, people took care of things in their own home, but all of a sudden, huge amounts of industrial production that made use of sewing machines was being done by women working outside the home. Uh, I haven't been able to find a tremendous amount of detailed information, but I am guessing that the mitten factory that was here in Blue Rapids in the early 1900s must have used sewing machines and probably provided a lot of jobs for women in the community at that time. Something I was fascinated to learn is that sewing machines were one of the first items that were sold, marketed on purpose with installment purchasing plans, pay, pay over time. Uh, you can do the inflation adjustment formulas and uh, compare it to modern sewing machines, but the numbers are such that we may uh, have sticker shock when we look at a modern sewing machine that costs X number of thousands of dollars today. But people in the early years of sewing machines, uh, actually well into the 20th century, these were incredibly expensive investments. Uh, Today we talk about, well, maybe an automobile is the second biggest investment next to your house. Uh, in this period, the sewing machine was probably in that category. They were incredibly expensive. Uh, months and months and months of a family income would be represented in the price of a sewing machine. So, installment purchasing on a large scale first came to the fore in the marketing of sewing machines. And, and look where installment for, for purchasing, credit cards, etc., is today. So, sewing technology, sewing machines influenced that part of our culture. Uh, even as the sewing machine was not just one single invention, we didn't go from A to B in one step with the development of sewing machines. We have some hand crank ones. We have an example here. This is probably from approximately the 1880s, and this one has not been refurbished. It has been slightly cleaned up and minimally serviced, but you could sew on that right away today. Uh, treadle operated machines were an obvious choice for people in remote areas, and that continued for a long time, uh, well into the 20th century, until uh, electricity became more commonly available. The switch from shuttles to bobbins, uh, many of you may be familiar with machines that take the long shuttle bobbin instead of the round rotary bobbin. Uh, shuttle machines make excellent stitches, but for compactness of storage, a quietness of use, and control over the quality of your stitch, the move from shuttles to round bobbins was a, a major step. We talked about how a lot of the machines had the capability of using electric motors, but the customer didn't have electricity to take advantage of that. Well, as the decades passed, electric drive conversions were sold. So in, uh, in the case of White, Wheeler & Wilson, some of the other major manufacturers, uh, where their sewing machine salespeople would actually uh, traverse the area <coughs> selling sewing machines, there was a period in the 20th century and some of the earlier decades where the big product for sale was actually a conversion kit to convert your treadle machine to electric motor. And then eventually factory built electric machines uh, beginning in probably in the late 20s, early 1930s became prevalent. I mentioned the zigzag. It was available, but it wasn't really mass market accepted until the 1940s. And then special stitches that a lot of us are familiar today with on our, on our modern machines. So we have a mechanical device that's gone through a lot of development, a lot of growing pains, and a lot of modernization over many, many decades. But the story really isn't about a machine. Uh, it's really the story here is throughout all of this development, the main character, the main player in this story is the sewers and quilters of America. Uh, I would guess that almost all of us here have a family story, maybe we have a family machine, maybe we have memories about sewing and quilting, maybe we have some quilts. Uh, 
this really isn't about machinery. This is really about us, the, the, the people in our part of the country that have grown up with these machines or knowing about these machines. So a little history. Um, this is an 1861 Grover and Baker chain stitch machine, as opposed to the more modern lock stitch machine. Now, this is a machine that's located in another museum in our region, and I restored this a little over a year ago. I'm not sure uh, the detail of this, but this would have come to our, our area in a wagon train. It was way before the railroad came through this area in the late in the 1870s. Uh, and I encourage you to think about all you can carry for your trip west is, has to fit in your wagon, space-wise and weight-wise. And the people that had this machine valued it highly enough and valued it as part of their survival that they were able to allocate space for that in their wagon when they came out here. So that's an 1861 Grover and Baker. Uh, if anyone's been taking notes, you'll remember that the names Grover and the name Baker appeared in the sewing machine combine uh, when that was set up in the late 1800s. So a little bit after this, uh, the principals in this company participated in the sewing machine combine and contributed to the development of that. Well, by the 1880s, uh, sewing machines were beginning to look uh, a little bit like what a lot of us are familiar with uh, from our ancestors or from machines that have been handed down in our family in our family. Uh, this is another machine that's made by the, the White Sewing Machine Company in the 1880s. Um, I refurbished this one probably a year and a half ago. Uh, this was in pretty good shape mechanically, but uh, it didn't take too much work to get it back, and you can see its beautiful appearance. Uh, draw your attention here. Most of the machines we have here in front of our tables have rectangular bases. This is a curved base known as the fiddle base. Uh, kind of a functional uh, feature, but I think it's a beautiful feature. Uh, so you see by this time in the 1880s, the standard cabinet, the machine in the middle, the wide legs, and the, the treadle platform have pretty much evolved. And they remain Pretty, uh, pretty prevalent all the way up to the earlier decades of the 20th century. Well, continuing on a theme of sewing machines contributing to our culture, uh, providing jobs for women, and some of those things I mentioned earlier in the program, uh, sewing machines contributed to the war effort. In both World War I and World War II, the millions of uniforms and accessories that were produced probably physically could not have been done without automated sewing machines. Uh, imagine hand stitching. Uh, I believe the figure in World War II was something like 16 million people in uniform uh, aggregated throughout the war. Uh, imagine hand stitching all the clothes that all those folks wore uh, during the war. So the picture you see here, it's easy to see the first machine in the line, and if you look close, you can see other machines down the line, but there are multiple production lines, literally production lines of sewing machines producing goods under government contract in World War II. In World War II, the War Department took this as serious, so seriously as to, uh, to write a specification, and if any of you are familiar with, the, with that kind of literature, there's a lot of specifications for just about anything. But the specification for sewing together certain types of uh, government contract equipment was referred to as the 201 stitch. This is a Singer 201, and that's what that specification is named after. Uh, and we'll talk about that machine a little bit later. So many, many jobs outside the home contributing to the war effort, and the war effort certainly uh, with the contribution of sewing machines has influenced how our culture went. Well, after World War II, development continued. Uh, we talked about the zigzag, also known as swing needle machines. Uh, Singer introduced that and the market accepted it. Uh, another Italian company, Michi, uh, was building some fabulous uh, swing needle machines at the time. And finally, the market was ready for them. Uh, 
there were improvements in the sewing machine casting construction. Uh, if you're ambitious, and I, I don't encourage you to do this, but these machines here weigh about 40 pounds. The, the Singer 201, maybe a little bit more than 40 pounds without the cabinet, just sitting here. Well, in the late 40s, there was a, a move away from cast iron machines and going to cast aluminum. This machine here is from the late 40s. It weighs between 16 and 20 pounds. It's made out of cast aluminum, even though it's roughly the same size as this other one. That was a major innovation. In fact, prior to World War II, uh, there was experiments in casting aluminum that were not very productive. Uh, but in the spirit of recycling, with thousands and thousands of aluminum-based aircraft coming back from World War II that weren't going to be needed in the future, there was a lot of impetus for the aluminum industry to really get to, up to the table, do some research, and they did figure out how to successfully cast aluminum, and the sewing machine industry <coughs> benefited. The slant shank machines were an innovation that came after World War II. You see that with this machine and this machine here. And we'll talk about uh, those in a little more detail than that. Well, after a very successful uh, 100 or so years of sewing, sewing machines in America kind of reached a twilight. Uh, many people became less interested in sewing machines. Uh, fewer people were sewing. And for a couple decades, uh, if, if we would have charted this, the, the curve would have been downwards. Uh, why are sewing machines no longer built in America? Foreign competition, extremely low labor rates in other countries, environmental regulations in this country that impacted uh, how the factories would operate, what kind of materials they could and could not use, how those materials needed to be disposed of, uh, all added to the, uh, the picture of not being advantageous to continue to manufacture machines here. And another factor is the rise of consumer culture. Uh, for whatever reasons, people over the last few decades uh, have been accustomed to products that are built with planned obsolescence, products that are built to replace, not repair. And the evidence of that is in some of the more modern machines, uh, only a certain amount of replacement parts are built. Uh, you may need a circuit board for your XYZ machine that's eight or nine years old, and you find out that uh, there are no replacement parts manufactured, uh, even if you can find someone to service that machine. So for that and a lot of other reasons, sewing machines in America kind of hit a twilight period, and, and it looked pretty glum for a while. But uh, there's been a renaissance. Gay has been quilting for quite some decades. Uh, I, I won't disclose how long that's been. <laughs> and uh, I have been interested in the, the manufacturing and technological history of sewing machines for uh, probably going on 25 years now. And it surprised me just a few years ago, I was pleasantly surprised, that vintage sewing machines are attracting attention. And even better than that, I think, in the long run, they're attracting attention of a new generation of sewists. I, I think not too long ago, uh, many of us could have gone to a, a quilt guild or a sewing workshop, and we would have a, a, a pretty good idea of the demographic of people that would be at those workshops. Well, in just recent years, we've discovered that they're most literally a new generation, maybe a new couple of generations, and they admire the vintage machines for their solid construction, their serviceability and repairability, and uh, something that really means a lot to me, and I'm sure to many of you, they value their vintage machines because of the nostalgia and family connections. And probably an even bigger factor than that in driving the renaissance of, of sewing in general and vintage machines in particular the vintage machines like you see here today, uh, many of them are the perfect tool to use in conjunction with some techniques and tools that have recently been developed uh, to use lure footwork and templates. And uh, a couple of new companies have been developed to accommodate that. 
So, to summarize, vintage machines are built to last and to be maintained, not replaced. They incorporate industrial soil design and manufacturing techniques. None of the machines we have here are industrial factory machines, but most of these machines could handle uh, industrial type work on an intermittent or short term basis. They're that well built. They were initially supported by a strong service and repair industry. Uh, sewing machine shops, various manufacturers were in almost every community. Most of those shops have closed out, have closed up, the people have gone uh, on. And the surviving shops typically will only sell and service modern machines. Uh, if you do know of a sewing machine shop that takes care of vintage machines, uh, you have got a big advantage. Uh, most of the work done is restoration and maintenance by people who have mechanical and engineering backgrounds and bring that background to the work that it takes to keep these wonderful machines running. There's a lot of uh, disagreement about what's vintage and what's antique. Uh, how old is my machine? Is my machine old enough to be antique or new enough to be vintage? Uh, personally, I don't think that makes a lot of difference. Uh, most vintage or antique machines can be refurbished and brought back into use for modern sewing. Uh, the 1861 machine that I showed you earlier in the presentation is perfectly capable of sewing right now after refurbishment. The only reason that the museum there doesn't do that is there is one particular spring in there that we believe is irreplaceable if it ever would break. Uh, but that shows you how far back you can go with, with proper maintenance and proper care and get these machines back into sewing condition. If you really want to get in to coupling your vintage machine with ruler work and some of these other modern techniques for sewing and quilting, uh, there are some uh, stars that I call from the, the vintage period that are particularly well suited. Uh, those of you that are interested in free motion quilting, uh, if you can do free motion quilting and treadle at the same time, you're way ahead of me skill wise, but uh, there are machines that can be adapted and, and work very well with that. So we're going to look at some of these machines. The Singer Model 201, the Rolls-Royce of sewing machines. The Singer Model 301A, and I think I mentioned this earlier, the first commercially successful slant needle machine. The Singer 221 Featherweight and the 401A, there's no sharp cutoff about the end of the vintage era, but the 401A Singer is the one I use to represent an icon at the end of that era. So here we go. The Singer Model 201 has been referred to as the Rolls-Royce of sewing machines. In fact, uh, this was the machine of choice when Rolls-Royce began to uh, introduce leather seating into their automobiles. It has a direct drive motor. There's no belts. The motor's in back here. It's engaged directly into a gear train. It runs in the upper arm and underneath. And these are strong, they're quiet, and if they're well maintained, they probably literally will keep sewing forever. The Singer 221 was built from the 1930s into the early 60s, and over three million of them <clears throat> were built at the time. Now, why the term featherweight? This weighs 11 pounds, including the case that it comes in. This weighs over 40 pounds. So if you're going to go to a sewing workshop, a quilt workshop, any event like that, this is probably the one you want to carry, not the 40 pounder. Uh, you can see in the picture here, factory furnished case. And uh, I like this reference. This is not my phrase, but I, I, I noticed this in my reading at one point, the darling of modern day quilters of a new generation. Mm -hmm. And in the last couple of years, again, I have become acquainted with a number of people that really fit that, uh, that demographic description. So that's the Featherweight 221. Next slide. The Singer Model 301A, introduced in the very end of the 1940s, this also is much lighter 
than the previous cast iron machines. It has a neat little handle, it clips up, and easily portable. Uh, this was the first Singer model that was offered in a color other than black. And if you look at the machines we have in front of us, and look at some of the museum machines behind you, it's kind of a refreshing break <laughs> to see a, a sewing machine in a color other than black, even as beautiful as they are. But this is the first one. Uh, this obviously is a black one, but they eventually came in a couple of different uh, uh, two-tone colors. The handle I showed you for portable use, and for people that like the slant machines, one advantage is the improved visibility of the needle where it actually engages the fabric. This is the Singer 401A. And I mentioned this is the icon I used to indicate the end of the vintage era. You can select a lot of special stitches here, and you can also put in a variety of cams on top here to make even more special stitches. So this machine does straight stitch, it zigzags, there's more special stitches here, and optional special stitches here. And for people who are into free motion quilting, the feed dogs lower and raise with this lever here. And all without any electronics or with all computers. I probably use as many electronic devices as, as many people do, but it's fascinating that the state of the art reached the point where they could do all this in a machine with strictly mechanical engagements. So we talked about uh, the modern techniques that are part of the renaissance of vintage sewing machines, uh, and ruler work is the premier technique of that. What is ruler work? It's a technique of quilting developed by Leone Westley a few years ago in Australia, and uh, their company has expanded, uh, diversified a little bit, and they now have a sales and manufacturing facility in Oregon that produces a, on custom order uh, ruler feet and quilting systems for a huge variety of, of uh, sewing machines. And Just So Vintage is our local retailer for that area. We've been an authorized uh, retailer for Wesley since 2018, and ruler, ruler feet and templates are available for most types of machines, vintage and modern, and I, I mentioned a couple reasons why they are so adaptable and, and, and so compatible with the vintage machines, but if you have a, a modern machine, you can have those lower feet and templates manufactured to your order to fit your particular machine by model number. That's fine. Ruler work uh, lets you create attractive quilting designs on a standard domestic machine. Uh, it provides excellent design results without requiring the extensive manual skills that I don't have for free motion. Uh, I'm okay with making samples of free motion quilting to determine if we've got the stitch and the foot, uh, the stitch quality correct and the foot adjusted correctly, but I can't sit down and consistently make uh, good looking quilt designs. With ruler work you can. Uh, a lot of quilters do beautiful work with the top, they get the batting and the backing sandwiched appropriately, and they run into the problem of who's going to quilt my top batting, bat, uh, backing sandwich. Uh, a lot of people that do commercial quilting are backlogged, so you've got a long time span you're facing. Uh, it's a very expensive process, and rightfully so, I will so say for the people that do that. Uh, so. Ruler work can help you uh, do more of the process yourself and save money in the process. Uh, vintage machines, I will repeat, are the ideal platform and they're being increasingly utilized. Next slide. So what is it? This is a ruler foot. It goes on the, the shank of your machine where your regular presser foot would fit. This picture here is the ruler foot engaging a template. And if you can see close enough here, you can see this particular template is used to space out parallel lines. But there's a lot of designs that can be done. Uh, this is just a few of the designs 
that are uh, available for different kinds of quilting patterns that can be done with the ruler feet. So the, you want to get a ruler foot that fits your machine and uh, designs that are the kind of design you prefer to put into your quilt. Uh, these are samples of some stitches. There's a beginner starter set available. We have a couple of them here with us today uh, that include the, the ruler foot and the starter feet. And these are some of the designs that can be done. Not all of these are included in the starter fit feet in the starter kit, excuse me, but this gives you an idea of what is available. Um, this is a short video that shows the ruler foot and the template. And this is a featherweight 221, just like this machine here. And uh, it's using the Wesley ruler foot to make this design. So that's a real quick peek at uh, what ruler feet work is uh, and some of the accessories that come with that. It's not the intent of this program here today to go into the detail about the mechanics and the use of these, but if this is of interest to you, I encourage you to watch the museum literature. There will be some workshops coming up in several weeks on using techniques like this. Uh, I believe the economy block is going to be the block that's subject of that workshop. Uh, so if you're interested in ruler feet, uh, that's uh, learning how to do it, that's a workshop opportunity that's coming up. Uh, if you already are quite interested in it, we have some of the low shank feet here and we can take your orders for uh, specialized feet and templates that will fit your particular machine if it's not a low shank machine. Uh, if, uh, if you're here virtually, uh, keep track of our email address and our phone number and we can help you out that way. Uh, so to include, conclude here, uh, sewing machines have been part of the history of our culture since their development in the 1850s. And during that 150 years, they've influenced our cultural heritage many years and we continue today to, to feel the, the impact of that heritage. New developments like ruler foot techniques with vintage machines, uh, I think are gonna contribute to the renaissance and keep that renaissance of vintage machines moving and growing as we move farther into the future. So, thank you very much. Uh, that's what I have to say for Just So Vintage today. Uh, as I mentioned, we are a retailer for Wesley products. Uh, we restore and sell vintage sewing machines, so if, if you need a refurbishment or a repair, uh, contact us. If you don't have a vintage machine and you think you might like it, like one, maybe we can help you out. So thanks a lot, everyone.